Nine children have died from infections linked to strep A, with hospitals reportedly ordering extra antibiotics to deal with the increasing number of cases. It comes as thousands of ambulance workers and nurses are due to walk out in a row over pay this month, adding more pressure to an already stretched healthcare system. Health Secretary Steve Barclay joins us now. Um, Secretary of State, this is a depressing scenario. Are, I mean, we are clearly at crisis point with the NHS. Mm. Are you going to be able to fix it, both in the short term and over the long term? People are worried. We should be. Well, I think we all recognise the NHS has been under huge pressure as a consequence of the pandemic, and we see that in the, the number of people that are waiting for their operations. And that's why we're announcing today a further 19 community diagnostic centres. What they will do is an extra one million a year uh, test and scans as part of us getting that electives backlog of operations down. It builds on the 91 that we've already opened, uh, and it's a key process, a priority for us with the task force that we're launching in number 10 to make sure that all tests uh, adopting best practice and, and we're really investing in those diagnostic centres, the new surgical hubs, and getting those elective backlogs down. That just, that, uh, forgive me, uh, that, that just sounds like a load of here's things we're doing. I mean, we've got, we've got hospital waiting lists that are huge. We've got people yep. not being picked up by ambulances. We've got people not being able to get into, get into hospital because they're told there aren't enough beds and there aren't enough doctors and there aren't enough nurses. We're about to have strikes going on there. And you've just given me a list of diagnosis centres. I mean, that... I mean, even if they were all in place tomorrow, that wouldn't fix the problem, would it? What is going to happen this well, winter? Uh, Should people feel safe taking their, themselves or their elderly parents or their children to accident and emergency? Well, there's a huge range of things we can do, and we can, we can go through in turn uh, how we're responding in terms of the, the workforce pressures, the extra people that we're recruiting. There's 3% more doctors this year than last year, 3% more nurses, an extra 1,000 nurses. In terms of paramedics, Sorry, we've got Can I just check on those statistics? In... Is, that the actual, is that more recruited or the total number of doctors and nurses in place at the moment? Because retention, the, the... it's not just about recruitment, retention's crucial of too. Of course it is. Of course it is. So, so that's the number of doctors in place. But you're right, we've got more in training as well. We had a 25% increase in the number of medical undergraduates. Now, obviously, those take much longer to, to come into place because it's a seven-year training course. Um, but we've opened five new medical schools, so we're boosting the number in training. We've got more paramedics in training. We're at 3,000 paramedics. So, so you're right, part of it is, is how we get more people into training. Part of it is retention around the existing staff. That's why, for example, we've accepted in full the recommendations of the independent pay review body. It's why we prioritised uh, health last year when the rest of the public sector had a pay freeze. We, we gave the NHS 3% because we recognised the significant pressures it faces. It's also why, despite the cost of living challenge that the country faces and the many competing pressures on the economy, at the autumn statement, an extra £6.6 .6 billion was allocated so to the I, NHS as yeah. a priority Mr. area. Barclay, so so when I you say we're, mm. we're doing lots of things, we are doing lots of things. Okay. So part of it is on workforce, part of it is the announcement today in to terms ask... of the diagnostics equipment, but mentioned. part of it Can is I on retention as well. How many GPs did you say had been recruited? Extra There's, GPs? So the three, uh, so G, well, GPs is, so I, I said doctors, which is 3% more doctors. In terms of GPs, there's about 2,300 more than at the time of the, the last general election as part of our commitment there. But it's also about okay. the wider primary Since, care. Sorry, workers. sorry, I, I seem to have different figures. Since 2019, the total fully qualified full time equivalent GPs in England has fallen by 719. So it's 2,300 more uh, doctors in primary care since 2019. We've got around 9,000 GPs. So are uh, they GP fully qualified full time equivalent GPs. GPs? Well, there's a range of jobs in primary care. And so the, the point I'm making is we've, we're recruiting more. We're recruiting more people into primary care. There's a whole range of workforce that works okay, in we, primary there's care. There's an we've argument got, about gross and net got, this morning. Yeah. Um, have we got a net so, loss of full-time GPs? We've got more doctors in primary care, but we've got more people working in primary care as a whole. Now, a GP no, sorry, itself... The, the a figure GP, we've got well, is that we've got look, a loss of GPs. Mean, GPs... Yeah, but and, and GPs take you 10 seem years. to be using other, uh, other words... But the fact okay. of the matter is we're losing. We've got a net loss of GPs. Meanwhile, well, we you had to, a manifesto well, we pledge... In yeah. Hang on. Yeah. You had a manifesto pledge in 2019 
that you would increase the GP workforce by 6,000 yes. by 2025. Yes. You're nowhere near that if you're, well, if you're well, losing. So, so again, just to be clear to you, is that 6,000 figure, the, the 2,300 is, is on the trajectory to, to that 6,000, but it's part of a wider manifesto commitment in terms of boosting the number of people working in primary care, because not everyone, obviously, when they go to the GP, uh, where, where needs to see the GP. Sometimes it is the GP, sometimes it may be the, the, uh, the paramedic that's working in the, the primary care centre, sometimes it may be the mental health support work. Uh, that's been done. Have so there's a range of people in primary care. Have you tried to see a GP recently, Mr. Barkley? Yeah, we've got 90,000 uh, a day more GP appointments than last Have year. Have you tried uh, to get a GP appointment recently? Uh, I haven't needed to go and see a GP well, you're recently, very lucky fortunately. Because unfortunately, it is like uh, they're rare. Well, let me at the moment. Let me just they're, let me. It is hard to get a GP so appointment, and at the me, moment, people well, are that. very concerned. Sure. So, I mean, can, can, strep A. Let's talk about strep no, well, A in I, children. Can I, you, can I just answer the last question, if I may? Yes. Because you say, and I recognise that one of the things we're trying to tackle is that 8 a.m. Monday morning scramble uh, in terms of phone calls to GPs. But firstly, just as a, a point of fact, there's 90,000 more GP appointments a day compared to last year. 150,000 more. Uh, compared to before the pandemic. So GPs are seeing more people and 40% of those are same day. So when people say, you know, no one can see a GP, the reality is GPs are working incredibly hard. One in seven patients did not get an appointment when they tried to book in October and that is double the amount there in is, October in the, in the, last there year. Is, there is huge demand on our NHS as a consequence of the pandemic. Uh, but what I'm saying is more, more people are getting GP appointments. There's 90,000 more GP appointments a day, excluding COVID vaccinations, compared to last year. A further but it is 2 right million that this patients system... were made to wait more than a month to see their doctor. In but the your, same your, month. your, the your most assertion was records began. Your, in your assertion was people weren't getting to see a GP. What I'm saying is there's huge pressures, and again, we can go through a range of things that we're doing around investing, for example, in in telephony, so we can have call back and everyone isn't waiting and phones in the way. So there's technology solutions. We're looking at the wider workforce in primary care. We're looking at how we make better use of our pharmacists, who can often offer more services, often things that people are going to see the GP. We're looking at how we get more GPs in training, which is a key area of focus. You mentioned retention. Again, that is extremely important in the context of some okay. of the pension changes that we're consulting. So there's a range of things. I recognise there's huge pressure on primary care. There's no one single answer on that. There's a range of things that we're doing. But it is important also to note that GPs are working incredibly hard. Oh, there's no doubt seeing 90,000 no more that. people Sorry. a day compared to Can I to ask you about strep A? Please, yes. uh, Mr Barclay, because if I was a parent of a child and I was worried because somebody in their year group had strep A, um, what should I do and would my child get antibiotics? Yeah, now, firstly, I think I recognise there is a, a lot of worry. I'm a parent myself. I think a lot of parents are, are worried uh, about this. And, and firstly, uh, I mean, about one in five children naturally have, have this. Uh, in terms of complications, they're extremely rare but what we're saying to parents is if you do have a child who is sick then please go on the NHS website it is a time to be more vigilant uh, and there's very clear guidance on the NHS website in terms of what to look for so many of the conditions are sort of common in terms of sore throats uh, and so forth the complications are actually extremely rare but it is important that we're vigilant one of the other concerns that people have is around the availability of antibiotics. And again, that's something I checked uh, last night. We're in very close contact with the medical suppliers. Uh, they're clear that they don't have shortages of stock on the key antibiotics uh, at the moment. Uh, so they're very reassuring uh, on that. Clearly, sometimes when there's significant demand from an, a particular GP practice, then the suppliers will move that stock around their warehouse depots. But in terms of me checking last night, in terms of whether we have confidence in the suppliers, the suppliers were concerned, uh, clear that they haven't notified any concerns to us. And where there are surges in demand, then they will, they will use their existing practices to move that around their, their depots. Secretary of State, uh, just to finish quickly, forgetting the statistics for a second, and you've given us a long list of those, we have an ambulance strike and we have a nurses strike coming. 
What is your message to the public about the faith they can have in the service they will receive from the NHS amid those strikes? What should the public be doing? Should they be going to hospitals? Should they be going to A&E? In practical terms, what is your big message as the Secretary of State for Health with the strikes that are coming with an NHS that is already under crisis? Well, we're prioritising... The NHS is our number one priority and we're working hard and constructively with the trade unions to look at their wider set of demands and how we can work with them. Uh, in terms of, of the public, uh, then clearly you know, we will prioritise that there will be an impact if the strikes go ahead uh, in terms of care and we're prioritising through our contingencies so we do as much as possible to mitigate those and we're actively engaging with the trade unions in terms of what derogations, what services they continue during the strikes. But we're, we're keen to work with them. My door is very much open. We're open to talks with them on the range of issues that they've raised. But in terms of the pay specifically, it is right we have an independent process and, and that's the key thing that we've uh, had. That's we've the independent had an process that you set, the government sets the remit for that. I, I do, you have an independent process but we have 14% RPI inflation, 11% CPI inflation, and they were offered a 4% pay rise. It, it, I mean, you can see why people are questioning that. Who sets the remit for that independent process? Who sets the dynamics which they are assessing pay upon? That's set by government, well, isn't it? Well, the, 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 there is a, a... The government contributes, the trade unions, the, there's a range of membership of those independent bodies, including trade union representation on them. But to your wider point, if we were to simply give everyone across the public sector a pay rise in, in line with inflation, which, Martin, is in essence what you're saying, that would cost us £28 I was, billion. I, was stating, I was stating what inflation figures were and stating well, what the pay we, rise was. I didn't, well, I didn't, I didn't make a, sure, an equation. Okay. I asked you how it is if, worked out. If, if, if we were to give a pay rise across the public sector in line with inflation, that would cost us £28 billion. Pounds. And I think what we've got to do is also be fair to, to your other viewers uh, who, you know, are not getting 19% pay rises, which is what the trade unions have demanded. That's around three times more what many of your viewers in the private sector will be getting at a time of costing living pressures. So, so it isn't affordable for us to give everyone a pay rise, of, you know, which would cost a 28 billion in line with inflation. And it's not affordable to give a pay rise of 19%, which is what the trade unions have demanded. It, what matters is we are investing in the NHS, an extra 6.6 .6 billion over the next two years. That is our priority. We're focused today with our diagnostics announcement on how we target those of your viewers waiting for their operations. Uh, and in terms of the, 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 the conversations with the trade unions, we've implemented in full what the pay review body uh, recommended. And of course, last year we gave a 3% rise when the rest of the public sector had a freeze. Secretary of State, we appreciate your time today. Thank you for joining us. Right. <laughs> There's like lots of questions and um, uh, some frustrating answers. I, I, I think we need to hear we are going to go through a difficult time um, and we understand the difficulties that are going on for NHS staff and we understand I would not want to be in charge of the NHS at the moment. I think it is a very, very difficult job uh, with the resources that we have, an ageing population, increasing medical costs. But I think we all need some guidance about what we should be doing as well and how to think about what's going forward. I'm not sure I, I quite got the answer I was hoping for there in terms of I, I wanted something a bit, do this, don't do this, here's what faith you can have, here's what you should use. Hopefully they'll work on those messages what, as we get near a strike. The striking, the striking workers wanted to hear that they were going to get a pay rise. Yeah. Um, and they didn't hear that. Or certainly not to the level that they've asked for, so it doesn't sound like those strikes are going to One would to expect him not to negotiate amid a TV interview, though, to be fair. <laughs>